Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Best Practices Session 1 uh, in 2022. As the previous sessions, we are starting through Zoom sessions. You know, our conditions have changed, but we are still uh, doing through Zoom. So for this first opportunity, we'll have two speakers, Dr. Harrison Wright, and Jeff Franklin, and we'll finish with an inter a discussion with Steve Ells. And sadly, uh, Marcel Cobb will be unable to attend this session, but we'll be discussing anyway, very interesting topics uh, about the, the, the growing season and how it's starting everything and how they saw the, the problem. So I will give the word to the president of Gigans, Steve Ells. Welcome everyone to our fourth season. It's hard to believe already this is our fourth season of best practices. So um, yeah, and as uh, Francisco says, we'll probably do most of them on uh, Zoom again, just because it's really convenient for everyone, uh, cuts down on travel and everything. So um, I think it's a really great delivery system we've come, come upon here. So yeah, just like to thank everyone and um, for joining in and hopefully ask lots of questions. We'll try to answer them best we can, and I hope uh, everyone gets something out of this. So um, at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Harrison Wright. He's gonna give us a nice talk on everything he's found out over the last bit about uh, bud hardiness and and all the good stuff from the data collection all through the winter. So uh, welcome Harrison Wright. Thanks, Steve. Francisco, um, I'll share my screen here. How's that? Can you guys hear and see the presentation? Yes, looks great. Thank you. All right. Well, again, thanks, Steve and Francisco, for this opportunity. It's always good to be able to talk to growers about um, some of the stuff we're doing and hear back from uh, how uh, you guys are doing. Um, so today, uh, I'm talking about uh, wine grape or <laughs> wine grape bud hardiness. Um, this is from the Plant Physiology Program at the Kempfield Research Station, which is uh, right now primarily comprised of uh, myself and Jeff. Um, after a day like today, I know, I know it seems odd to be talking about uh, winter hardiness, but this is something that affects uh, us 365 days of the year, even on days like this. Um, wine grape hardiness is important. So um, just an overview of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Let's see if I can hide this window a second. Okay. So first, I'll just do a little bit of an overview about the wine grape uh, winter hardiness season that we had this past year, how it compared to other seasons and uh, what we found. Um, with our butt hardness survey. Um, also, we're going to talk about some of you may know and some of you may not about the January 22nd event this year. Um, we had a deep freeze event at some sites, or it got pretty cold at some sites and it got really cold at other sites. Um, so, we'll talk a little bit about that. Also, I, I've talked about this before, but we've continued to collect data on the, the Kenful selections, um, look at how. Uh, how their winter hardiness is compared to some uh, known cultivars like Lacadie over the past few years. We've now looked at them last uh, three or four years anyway. Um, I also talk about the last deep freeze event we had. Again, this affected some sites, but not others. But on February 15th, 2020, um, we also had a, a deep freeze event. Uh, got down to around minus 25 or minus 26 at uh, the Kempfell Research Station, or at the Kempfell Research Block, um, actually the station only got down to around minus 22, but other sites also got down to minus 25 or 26, and some people lost crop because of that other people were not affected at all. Um, I'm going to talk about winter minimum, minimums and deep freeze events uh, and the historical trends we're seeing over the years of, you know, uh, winter winter minimums. Uh, th these last three years have not been good for some sites and winter minimums. We, we had quite a few years before that where um, the coldest temperature got to was minus, you know, 16 or so at the research station. Uh, but, um, and so we thought maybe this wasn't that big of an issue, but the last three years, at least for some of us, uh, these winter freeze events have been a problem. Um, okay, so first thing on the agenda, 2021-2022 wine grape winter hardiness season. So for those of you who follow uh, the wine grape bud hardiness reports that we put out, um, this plot might look familiar. 
this is, uh, we have our winter temperatures up here. We have our historic minimums in the light gray. And then each of those colored plots is the hardiness level um, for our different cultivars. Uh, we follow five core cultivars and they, they separate out as they normally do. Uh, Marquette, the red hybrid, um, very winter hardy, comes out of Minnesota. So it's way down here. It really separates itself from the rest of the pack quite nicely. It gets down to uh, mid-December down to minus 30, and it pretty well stays there through Feb through uh, middle of February um, when we usually get our coldest temperatures. Um, next is Lackadee, you know, our other hybrid that we follow. Um, it's 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 hardy. It's hardy. It's quite hardy relative to vinifera. It's not so hardy when you compare it to other hybrids, though. It's, it's a lot less hardy than, say, Marquette or some of those other Minnesota varieties that we know of, but uh, but hardier than a vinifera. And uh, then all the other vinifera this year were kind of clumped together. Riesling separated itself out early. And this is a fairly hardy year for Riesling and uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. They're all up here. Their peak hardiness was, you know, around minus 23. Um, well, my, minus 25 or even a little colder at points, but um, yeah, they, they separate themselves a little bit, but they, they're around the same in terms of their hardiness, less than the hybrids, of course. So I was gonna mention this year, for whatever reason, uh, most varieties were a little bit, they reached a little bit hardier levels than in a normal year, which is a good thing for the temperatures we got in January, or some of us got. Um, why this is, we can only speculate. We're just measuring the hardiness and viability uh, as part of our current project, but uh, you know, conjecture that it might have been because we had a, a very long growing season last year. In a typical Nova Scotia, well, I say more, but as often as not, um, our leaves often get frosted off in the fall. Like uh, the, the leaves often on wine grapes, at least at least for us, um, they usually meet their end with a hard frost. You know, hopefully sometime in like late, late October or even early November. Uh, or yeah, it, so it's not often they senesce and fall off naturally. But uh, this year they did. Um, we had a very, our, our last frost in the fall was very late. And so it could be that they got a little bit hardier because they benefited from being able to set up for winter a little bit more uh, than in some years. La the last few years before that, the leaves got frosted off at, at many sites, which, uh, which can limit their hardiness a little bit. Um, I, will, I was gonna mention Lacadie seemingly grew harder after January 22nd our sites. Um, you can see right here that orange line is Lacadie, and you can see uh, you can see January twenty second. The hardiness suddenly dropped on that, and we'll talk about that. That has to do with that January twenty second event, and we speculate again that maybe it's because we lost some of a lot of the vinifera sites that were hit. They were almost completely hit, um, the ones that were damaged. Whereas Lacadie, they were just partially hit. Maybe they took some of the more sensitive buds. But I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. I guess I guess that's now um, January twenty second deep freeze event. So uh, a little bit of context here. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the temperature sensor at the Kentville site, at the, at the Kentville Environment Canada site, which is just up the hill, just up the hill, like maybe 100 meters from the station itself, it registered minus 22. Um, however, only a few hundred meters away and up a hill, mind you, which is maybe counterintuitive. Uh, the temperature was minus 26, and that's where our vineyard was. So uh, at minus 26, those are very damaging temperatures for all our vinifera and even Lacadie. Um, you know, that's not quite to the LT50 value, but you will see uh, LT50 again is the, the temperature at which you'll see 50% loss of your bud. So um, we didn't reach that level for Lacadie, but it was something a little short of that. And we did see damage. Um, so again, uh, you can see this is low temperature that I just highlighted with the red little dot there. That's the Environment Canada site, uh, red minus 22. But if uh, over only a few hundred meters away, you know, it was minus 26, and that crosses the line of the LT50 value for all of our um, all of our vinifera, and it also approaches the LT50 value of our D there. So for us, that wasn't very good. Other, other places only got down to around, you know, minus 20, minus 21 was fairly common. Um, but then there was other places like us that got down to minus 25, minus 26, or even, even colder. Um, I also mentioned this is the second such event we've had like this in three years. As I mentioned, the previous one event was on February 15th, 2020. So unfortunately, some growers at these hard hit sites, you know, will have seen damage this year and their crops will be down quite a bit. Other, other people were spared. Uh, hopefully they're in the majority. 
Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we see at our um, at our survey sites. So you can see here on the left, we have uh, our five cultivars and how many sites we're monitoring. And we can what we're looking at right now is what those LT values are. So the temperatures range, like I said, from around minus 20 to minus 25, minus 26, or even a bit colder. Um, quite a few are down in that minus 20, minus 21 range. But uh, to put this into context, Chardonnay, this is the average LT10 value. This is the value that you'd normally see around 10% bud death because of cold temperature. It's around minus, it's around minus 19, minus 20. So at minus 20, you're going to see a little bit of, you know, you'll see 10% of those buds die. Um, you know, the LT50 value just prior to that, this event, you know, that we did this just days before that January 22nd event, it was minus 24. So again, those sites that were minus 20 or minus 21, they were probably relatively safe. They probably only saw, you know, 10 or 15% mortality. Whereas, um, those of us who had sites that uh, got down to minus 25 and cooler with LT50 value of only minus 24 and an LT90 value of minus 26, we're going to see a lot of mortality. Um, with the lack of D, again, it's a little bit hardier. Um, its LT10 value was closer to minus 23 or minus 24, but again, certain sites surpass that. So you will see 10% more mortality in those sites. Um, thankfully, this, the secondaries on the lacadies are usually more fruitful than Chardonnay and some of the vinifera, so that'll that'll help us a little bit. But for those of us had, that saw temperatures again that were minus twenty five or minus twenty six, we're down into the LT ten, into the LT fifty range. So we're going to see again fairly significant mortality in some of those sites. But again, I'm I'm hoping that's the minority of sites. Um, Marquette, I, I like Marquette for the sole reason that um, we've been hit two times in the last three years at the Kentville site anyway, and our Marquette's never damaged, you know, it's LT 10 even is, is above or below minus 30, I should say. So you grow Marquette. I mean, I, I won't speak about all the other attributes of Marquette compared to some of the other uh, ones, but uh, at least you can sleep at night with the Marquette with my, with being uh, hardy down to minus 30, even at LT 10 value. Um, that's one thing it has going for it. Um, so again, uh, so we also did bud viability. So we can at least tell on our survey sites, and we have about 20 sites of different cultivars. Uh, maybe Jeff can correct me, 20 or 24. Um, the bud viability uh, before the January 22nd event was greater than 90%. I would say it's even probably closer to 95%, 90 to 95%. This is how viable the buds were going into January 22nd. So we go out and every site, every four weeks, we'd take, we'd look at about hundred buds. Um, and when we cut those open, you know, 90 to 95% of those were green and viable and going to give us a crop. So that's what it was like going in. This is, this is a picture of what it looks like when you open these, uh, when you open these buds, uh, the, the bud on the left, I think this is Chardonnay. It's a viable secondary bud. You can see it's nice and green. That bud front and center right there, that's a dead primary bud. And that's, that's the type of thing you see after um, a freezing of it. And quite often you'll see the primaries die before the secondaries. The secondaries, they're a little bit smaller quite often. Uh, they have uh, a little higher hardiness level than the primaries. Also, they're a little less fruitful usually, so maybe that also makes them a little bit more hardy. But um, so this is the typical thing we'd see after a freeze event, and this is the type of thing that um, hopefully, if you if you're worried about having damaged canes, this is something that you can check in your own vineyard as well. So uh, I'll now talk about this is again just our um, survey sites. These are the viabilities that we had after the January 22nd event and our five cultivars. And there's, I'll have to give a little bit of disclaimer for those uh, two that have the asterisks next to them. So uh, the Chardonnay, the top of the list there, I mean, we started at 90 or 95, like I said, but after, um, after that event, we had about 47% viability. Now I would say there's, there's quite, it, it's pretty well evenly split between uh, winners and losers. I'd say about half the sites that were in our, happened to be in our survey, a Chardonnay, half of them only saw like maybe 10 or 15% damage, but the other half, probably saw 80 or 90% damage. And our Kentville site was one of those ones. So um, it, it was usually, uh, there wasn't too much in the middle, at least for Chardonnay. Uh, it was either you had a pretty significant loss or you only had a, a minim, minimal amount of loss. Um, the lack of D, again, uh, there's some of those that were fairly hard hit. Um, some of them were as bad as 50% damage, but on average, we dropped from 90 to 95% viable to 72% viable. Now, Hope it'll be interesting to see. Hope maybe you might want to think about leaving a couple more of those secondaries that push on Lacadie. Lacadie are prone to pushing secondaries and primers at the same time. Some of the secondaries are fairly fruitful, so you have to do an assessment this year. 
if you have a lacadise site that you think was hit um, to see if you should be rubbing those extra shoots off or maybe you want to leave a couple more this year. The Marquette, as you can see, uh, this is a strong suit withstanding cold winters. Um, it started out 95, 96% viable and, uh, and it was still 96% viable after the January 22nd event. And I should mention that most of the Marquette sites were in some of the hardest hit sites. Our site was included in some other ones that were in some pretty cold areas. Um, they were able to stand those cold temperatures. The Pinot Noir fared pretty well, only 85%. Now I also put a disclaimer next to that because we only have three sites and those three sites were in some of the best areas. And that's probably not a coincidence. People who grow Pinot Noir are usually people that have, you know, it, a lot, a lot of people grow Pinot Noir, know they have, you know, want to do the, do the research and uh, you need a good site to grow Pinot Noir is what I'm trying to say. Most of these were in good sites. Most of them were not that badly hit. So 85% of the Pinot Noir sites uh, fared well there, not, not because they were really hardy, but because they were at exceptional sites. We only had a few sites in the survey. Reasoning, we saw 50% damage. It was kind of the same boat as Chardonnay. Um, we had a couple sites that were in pretty exceptional sites. They only got down to minus 20 or 21, but then we had a few sites that were minus 25 or cooler, and those ones suffered quite a bit of damage, those reasoning. Uh, Kempfell selections went to hardness. So I've, I talked a little bit about this, I think a couple years ago, I can't even remember if it was at an AGM or, or what it was, but uh, for those of you who don't know, um, there's, there's several, I would describe them as aromatic white hybrids that were developed in Kempfell several years ago by a retired breeder, Andrew Jameson, and uh, Beatrice Amiot has taken up the cause since then, and there's been a trial plot to, um, being grown at the research station. And uh, so these actually date back to the 90s. They've never been really developed. There's, there's a few of them out there in the industry, but they're not widespread. But um, so some of them are fairly promising uh, in, term, in, in terms of their capabilities to make wine. So you can see here's one, 94.2, which is a cross between Silva Blanc and uh, another, another earlier Kempfell selection. Um, none of these have names, by the way, they just have numbers still. We're, 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 uh, Beatrice is hoping to develop them in the next couple of years and, and hopefully give them some names. Uh, here's 96.2. It's another white grape set, Pippin, which uh, I don't know, maybe someone correct me. I, I think that's actually a uh, sibling of Lacadie. I'm not sure, but it's like Lacadie. And it's another cross. 96.4. This one, you can look at the vine, it has that red tannin in the cane and everything. It kind of looks like uh, Lacadie, and it has Lacadie as one of its parents. This is Lacadie and St. Pippin. And yeah, so looking at the hardiest levels, we've looked at the hardiness levels in these over the last several years. I'm just gonna look at it, show you a few plots um, over the last few years at uh, what was at or near their peak hardiness. So you can see these are the selections along the bottom. I can't remember if I, yeah, so here's 94.2, here's a 96.4, another two was 96.2 and Lacadie Blonde. So, uh, so we compared these three um, promising uh, white hybrid selections to Lacadie and just compared them Beatrice is looking at other aspects, but we're just looking at the hardiness levels here. Um, you can see uh, 96 or 94.2 and 96.4 kind of separating out in terms of their peak hardiness. They're both below, below minus 30 here, peak hardiness. And Lacadie and 96.2, they're, they're less hardy. They're around like minus 20 or minus 27 this year in 2019. Um, 2020, they really separate. Every year, every grape does not act the same too, I should mention, like um, different grapes have different needs. For the most part, a hardy grape is a hardy grape every year, but some years they really separate. And then other years, uh, based on different factors, um, they don't separate as well, as much in terms of their hardiness. So you can hear in 2020, they really did separate. Again, you see uh, 94.2 is again, well below uh, minus 30, so is 96.4. But then we have 96.2 and Lack of D, they're about the same. They're, they're way back there at minus 26 or minus 27. We had really good separation. So again, it's starting to look like 94.2 and 96.4 are a hardier white hybrid than uh, Lack of D is. Uh, we can't say the same for 96 or 96.2. Um, I wish I had actual names to actually say, but uh, so 2021 was a bit of an outlier. Um, again, we saw 94.2 separate itself out, but 96.4 didn't. Uh, there wasn't as much separation that year. And then we did it again here this mo most recent year. And again, we saw a pretty good separation. Again, we saw 94.2 and 96.4 separate themselves out. You can see Lacadie was all over the place this year and 96.2 was fairly variable as well. So anyway, um, again, we're hoping to develop, or Beatrice is hoping to develop these uh, selections more and um, especially 94.2 and 96.4 
uh, or something maybe to watch out for. Um, oh, so I guess this is just one more uh, one more slide talking about the hardiness of the different cultivars. Uh, because we had this cold event this last year, I mean, that, that's really a, a true test, you know, what actually dies when you have a cold event. Um, so just like the hardiness level suggests, uh, you know, before the hardiness, we didn't actually measure it, but we're assuming, you know, like most cultivars that had been tested, they're around 90, 95% viable. But after that January 22nd event, um, which it probably would have gotten around minus 26 or so at this vineyard as well, it's, it's fairly close to our uh, vineyard or the research vineyard. Um, they're about 74% viable, 96 964 was about 78% viable. So they, they lost, you know, 10 or 15% of their viability. Whereas uh, 96, two and lack of D, you know, they, they lost considerably more. They were down, you know, they lost about 50% of their buds. I talked a little bit about this. We have a little bit more data again in a previous meeting, but uh, in, in, after the February 15th, 2020 event, which was fairly similar to the one we had this year, um, we had a post deep freeze pruning trial. So the question is when you, when you do have heavily damaged vines like we did in 2020, um, what's the best thing to do to prune them? Um, and generally you wanna be more limited in what you prune, especially if you sense that you, or if you suspect that you might have phloem damage, um, it's one thing to lose the whole crop. But then when you start getting cold temperatures so bad that uh, it actually starts damaging the vascular tissue, tissue uh, that can be a problem as well. So, um, but then we have to also think, um, there's, there's different things you can do. You can spur prune, you can lay down extra canes. Um, so anyway, we, we took a couple cultivars and uh, did some different pruning trials. So we looked at Chardonnay, which is in 2020, had 98% mortality. We lost almost every single bud. Then we have Vidal Blanc, which is a hybrid that most of you are probably familiar with. And it's it's a, it's not as hardy either for a hybrid, hardier than a vinifera, but not, not particularly hardy for a hybrid. And we saw you know close to 76% mortality in that. Um, so we had four treatments. Treatment one is we just hardly hardly did anything. We left 10 bed spurs. We just trimmed those uh, canes from last year down um, and left 10 buds per uh, spur. We also did a three bud spur. Looks like this. Uh, this this was a nightmare a little bit to prune uh, when we tried to turn it back to cane pruning the following year, by the way. Um, then we did a double cane. So approximately, well, not approximately, exactly double how many canes we usually lay down. Usually we lay down two. Cordons. Uh, this year we laid down four because we knew there wasn't much viable in there anyway. And then uh, we thought we'd just try cutting it right back to the head. You know, we knew we weren't going to crop that year. We didn't want to deal with it. We thought we'd uh, promote vigor around the head. Um, there's possibly merits to that as well. So this is a plot with a bunch of numbers uh, from the year of the damage and the year following the, the yield. Um, I won't go into details with the numbers, but I'll just give you the takeaway numbers that we saw or the takeaway messages. So um, no pruning treatment produced a worthwhile crop in hard hedge Chardonnay. It didn't matter what you did, if you 10 bud spur or whatever you did, you got negligible crop. It did, all those buds were dead, so it didn't matter what you did. You weren't gonna get a crop that year. Um, it was a little bit different for Vidal. It did produce a higher spur pruning, the 10 bud spur and the three bud spur did produce a higher crop in the partially damaged Vidal. Um, cane pruning, double, the, the double cane and also pruning back to the head produced more shoots options at the head. So it produced when when you didn't spur prune and you, you still cane pruned or pruned back to the head, you approximately doubled the amount of shoots emanating from the head as you did if you cane pruned. That, that a lot of the vigor was taken out of the head. It went to those spurs. Um, and so the, the nice thing about the cane pruning, at least if you didn't have a crop anyway, you had lots of options at the head when you uh, cane pruned anyway, or if you cut back to the head. As far as year, year two, how, how did these different crops, uh, how, did the, how did these different pruning treatments in the year of the freeze affect the return crop, you know, the following year in 2021? Well, essentially there was no different, difference. Yield bounced back in year two, it didn't matter what you did. Everything, uh, I believe, uh, I mean, we got a ridiculous crop in the Vidal, I think, like seven or eight tons and, the, and all the lack of deed bounced back to about four tons per acre. So um, it really didn't matter what you did that year of the freeze, or at least in this trial. Um, the year following uh, was about the same result. So I don't know what I'm doing here in time now. This is the last thing I have to talk about. Winter minimums, deep freeze, historical trends. So especially when we have some freeze events, for, at least for those of us who are affected, we start thinking like, how often is this going to happen? Um, like, what's the trend in winter minimums? Are they, I assume they're not increasing because of, uh, you know, global warming. Um, but 
Yeah, so we do have a nice historical data set at the research station that dates back well over 100 years. So uh, I thought we'd look at that. So this is the winter minimums. You've got the year along the bottom. You know, it starts at 1913, goes uh, this data set I'm showing here up to 2021. And then we have the minimum temperature on the left. So each of these dots represents the coldest temperature. We only get one dot per year. This is the coldest temperature for every year dating back to 1913. So you, one thing you can see, highly variable. I mean, it's all over the place. It goes from, you know, minus 32 here. We got a couple times, you know, way back when in the 1920s and 30s. Um, we also had one of these uh, more recently, but not too recently. And then uh, some years, it only gets up to, it only got down to like minus 15 or minus 16. Um, but you can see the trend is definitely upwards. So back in 1913, on average, every year we'd get at least one night of minus 26. Now that's scary to think about now. And this is at the Kentville station. And just to remember this past um, January 22nd, when uh, we had that cold event in our vineyard, it was minus 26, but at the station where this one is, it was actually minus 22. So on average uh, in 1913, that was like four degrees cooler than we had this past January at that site. Um, now today at that same site, on average, it gets down to minus 20. So every year on average, but again, highly variable, it's gone up six degrees. So on average, every year we get a minus 20 at the Kentville site where that, where that site, where that weather has, where that temperature has been measured for the last hundred plus years. Um, so I will point out, I don't know if any of you remember 1993, I still remember, I wasn't thinking wine grapes back then, but I remember apples. Uh, I remember my family speaking in hushed tones one morning back in 1993, because the temperature was below minus 30 at our place. And uh, yeah, that, that caused a lot of problems, but uh, we haven't had a temperature like that in 30 years. Um, I just gotta draw your attention to this. Some of these warm winters we've been having. So um, you can see some of these winters that uh, I just picked an arbitrary temperature like minus 19, something below minus 20. So in the first 80 years of this data, that only happened twice. Um, in those three years, you can see we had a couple of dates. One was in the 50s, one was in the early 70s, it looks like, um, where we had a temperature that did not hit minus 19. So something short of minus 20. Now in, now in modern times, uh, that's happened a whole bunch of times. So it's, again, it's definitely warming. These, these, un, these warm winters we're getting um, are more the norm now. Now we still get those cold winters as well. You can see we, there's a bunch of temperatures down there, minus 20, minus 24. Is about, I'd say the average is about minus 20, 22 or 23, this little uh, section down here. I mean, the actual average is minus 20 because it's brought up by all these warm years that we have as well. But um, this, this is a modern event. These, these warm winters is something that didn't happen years ago or it was very infrequent. Now, now it's more common. Um, and again, uh, some of the trends. So this, this is the frequency of some of these damaging temperatures. So um, this line here, this is, the, this is the frequency that we'd get, say, a minus 22 event, an event just like the January 22nd one um, that we had this past year at the station. Um, if we got minus 22 um, at a lot of sites, that's, it'll get down to minus 25 when we have minus 22 there. Um, that caused a lot of damage to the vinifera and some damage to, uh, and probably no damage to the hybrids. Um, and then, so you can see that trend is, is going way down back in the 20s or 30s, almost every year we'd get a temperature like that. Almost every year we get a temperature like we got on January 22nd. That was uh, very consistent, but it's come down quite a bit. As for a minus 25 event, so this is a highly damaging event. It would kill most of the buds on our vinifera and also moderately damage a lot of the hybrids, less sensitive ones anyway. Um, again, that happened almost every other year back in the 1910s, 1920s, and now, that's a very rare occurrence. We, and again, at, even at the research station, we haven't had a minus 25 at, at the Environment Canada standard. At the Environment Canada weather station, I should mention. Um, that's a very infrequent event now. Um, that's all for me to talk about today. Um, yeah, again, I appreciate this opportunity. This is just some of the collaborators we have. And I also mentioned uh, we can do this work because of uh, the mandate we were given with the wine grape cluster here, Activity 7. And I have myself and Jeff's contacts here if anyone wants to follow up uh, after the meeting as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Harrison, for such an informative and nice presentation. It's quite interesting to, to hear and, and see with the graph what you have been presenting throughout the winter with Jeff. 
in the bad hardiness report. So to that and this, I invite you, if you have any questions, to write in the feature in the Q&A on the bottom of, of your screen, okay? So Harrison, I have only one, two questions, not too much, no worries. Uh, you mentioned about the share the name and 47% uh, of the ability. Yes. But you also explained that this number, it's because it was all around the place. So in places where it was very cold, you see, you saw more damage. So it, it's that the relation and how low was the temperature to, to see that huge so, uh, amount of damage. So I know uh, we had a couple sites. I can't remember what our coldest one was. I, I believe it was around minus 26. I don't know if we had one that was even colder than that, Jeff. I don't know. Um, but again, when you have a temperature inversion event like this, um, this is common. I mean, when you have temperature inversion events, certain sites, um, you know, you get, you get the cold air pooling more than others and you get these big discrepancies, even a few hundred meters away, like I said, at the research station, down where the environment Canada station is only a few hundred meters away, it was minus 22, um, but up, up the hill, it was uh, four degrees cooler than that. It was minus twenty six in parts of that in parts of that vineyard. So um, again, this is this is common with the temperature inversion. You get these this, these pockets of pool air, and quite often there's some sites that are usually good and some sites that are usually bad. But then um, there's nuances to it too. I mean, other little factors like um, even in a temperature inversion event, there's usually no wind, but sometimes there might be, you know, like a, a five kilometer an hour wind. You know, it, it might just be pushing from the right direction or the wrong direction to either help you or hurt you. Or if you're near the, or if you're near the ocean, maybe the tide's coming in and that saves you, or maybe the tide's going out and that hurts hurts you. I mean, um, so in general, there's good sites, there's bad sites, but also there's a little bit of luck involved with some of these little factors that can influence where the where the where um, that cooler is going to pull, or if a little bit of wind's like pushing it in the right or the wrong direction, um, that can swing it either way. So yeah, like I said, with with the vinifera. For the most part, we had people that really escaped it pretty well. Their temperature only got to minus 20 or 21 for them. Like you said, we only got, they only made us out somewhere between 10 or 15, maybe 20% damage. But then we had a handful of sites uh, that, you know, saw minus 25, minus 26, maybe even cooler. And those, those sites were heavily damaged. And for example, this last winter, uh, were you able to, to measure the candle varieties as well? Like measure the hardiness in them, you mean? Yes. Or like the Kempfel selections? Yep. Yeah, so we were able to measure them. We, we measured uh, the bud hardiness again. Uh, we've done this last few years, and this year was no exception. We me measured them, and like I said, uh, we had, we had uh, there's three main selections that were really being promoted right now. Um, and two of them, last three to four years, have really stood out as being more hardy than other ones. And we also, in that, in that trial, we also have uh, LACA-D included as kind of an internal standard. And that LACA-D, it's kind of, uh, it's not as hardy as these two. And there's not, the two more promising selections in terms of hardiness. Um, it kind of sticks with, LACA-D sticks with 96.2. It gets down to, you know, minus 26 or minus 27% hardiness, which is pretty good and, and is enough most years. Um, but then this year we had 50% damage in that block of Lackady. So it got quite cold in that block in the hardness where it was only minus 27. It got down too close to that. And we lost about half the buds in those Lackady. Whereas we only lost, you know, 10 or, or about 15% in those other two. Again, they're fairly similar to Lackady, these other selections. Um, I think Andrew would say they're more aromatic. They have maybe a little bit more, I don't know what the word is, not, not, to, not a thing against Lackady, but they're, they're bred to have, uh, to be more interesting, I guess. Um, in terms of their volatiles and aroma. Um, and yeah, a couple of those stood out and were better than Lackady in terms of their hardiness. And that, that was shown in the hardiness levels in terms of uh, what we measure using the DTA machines when we, when we put them in a controlled uh, event. And we also saw that when we actually looked at the mortality val values after the, that freezing event, there, there was more damage in Lackady and one of the selections and two of them stood out. Perfect. Yes. No. It, it was to to because you already mentioned that even though both vineyards in the in the research station are quite close, even though changing a little bit the topography can produce a big difference in the vines and yeah how susceptible they are. So even just a few hundred even just a few hundred meters and a few hundred meters up a hill in our case and that usually that's counterintuitive to a temperature inversion event. You'd think. Um, 
things you would think air is not going to pool at a higher level but uh, it is on a bit of a plateau parts of it uh, at the top of the hill there and so uh, obviously at least at least this last year and not in 2020 and in 2020 20 as well um we weren't very lucky yeah well they were these were my, my questions thank you very much harrison for all the information and to explain with uh, a lot of details everything yeah thanks so Thank you very much, Harrison, again, for, for your presentation. And now I would like to invite Jeff Franklin, like every year uh, and every session, giving us an update of the weather, his observations, and even some predictions right now. So Jeff, please. Uh, thank you, Francisco. Always uh, glad to do this. Always happy to talk about something that excites me. Just give me a second to uh, share my screen here. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, it looks great. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. okay, thank you. Let's move some things around here. So again, uh, thank you very much. My name is Jeff Franklin. Harris and I work together in the Plant Physiology Program, uh, Agriculture Canada. And yes, I'm gonna do a, a little review of the winter weather and some talk about uh, where things, we think things may be headed in the spring. So I show this plot every time we speak, and I think it's a good plot because it, uh, in a single plot, it, it wraps up, you know, in terms of temperature, the, the trends that we've seen all winter. So it runs from January 1st right up to uh, end of day today, or this afternoon, I should say. And the individual points are the average daily temperature. So just the min max divided by two. And the gray line that runs through here is actually the trend line. So that, but, but it's the 10 year trend line. So I use it as a, as a proxy for what we would expect temperatures to be. So we see that most of the points are, are above the gray line, then we're above average. If most of the points are below the line, then we're below average. And as you can see, we, we got both of those uh, conditions in the winter. Uh, we started off, uh, and I'm sure people were aware of this if you were prudent early, uh, you know, the first part of the winter was, was quite a bit below average. Right up to the middle of, or sometime in February, we started to average out a bit. And then over here, the first week of March, Right in here, we uh, we lost our snow, and it's as if uh, we were going to get a real early uh, ascension into spring. It didn't quite go that way, although we did stay above average through March and even through parts of April. And that is kind of hung on. Once we get into April and May, we start to go back into the cycling temperatures. We often see this in the spring, and it is a it, it is a problem for us. It can it can bring on some problems, and I I think we might have dodged them this year. But anyway, I, I guess we will know more when buds break. But and a particular concern, uh, what I'm going to show you in the next graph, is just the, the conditions that we had in early May. Uh, we had some, some seasonably cold temperatures and some, some really cold nights. So. so this plot is actually the, the hourly temperatures plotted from May 1st right on to May 11th. So we see the daily temperature cycles between the highs and the lows as measured at the Kempfell Research Station. And I've got a lot of uh, reference points on this graph. So the, the top line up here, the normal high temperature, this dotted line shows what we'd expect our, our daily high to be. And this dotted line here is our, what our normal low temperature should have been. And as you can see for the right up to May 11th, uh, just yesterday, we were, um, we were running quite a bit below average. Uh, our, our lows were quite a bit lower than we would have anticipated for this time of year. And in fact, if you look again at this plot, we've got, uh, I've put a line here at zero, and I'm going to call this the frost line. So any, any nights where temperatures went, went below this, then we would have had a frost, of which we had in May five frosts. Um, I'm not sure I didn't go back and dig down through the records to see how common this is, but the fact that we got five frosts isn't so much what concerns me. More, more what concerns me is the, the degree to which those cold temperatures happened on two of those nights. So we, we came, when I came in to work on this week, on Monday, we had already had these two events. Uh, one of those was almost minus three, the one on Saturday. And I was a little concerned that maybe um, we had exceeded butt hardiness for developing butts. 
because we know when we left off in mid-April, you know, we still had very good bar hardiness, but we know that by the time the buds break in May, they've lost that hardiness. They're essentially maybe one or two degrees below zero is all the hardiness that they have. So I, I, I thank you to Jake and Mel Eelman who, for, who donated some Lackety Blanc canes. I went over and got those on Monday. We ran the additional bud hardiness. And that's what these next two lines are down here. So Lackety Blanc LTE 10 and Lackety Blanc LTE 50. So I was able to estimate those from the, the canes I got from the Eelmans. So as you can see, for the conditions that we experienced in Kempville at the research station, we came very close to the LTE 10 value for Lackety. Uh, we were a long ways from the LTE 50 value, which is good. But unfortunately, we could only do the one variety because that's all that was available to us. My, my, my feeling, and, and this is based more on theoretical physiology, is that any vinifera varieties would have been quite a bit hardier than Lackety. So those LTE 10 values for Chardonnay and Pinot would have been quite a bit lower because those buds, as we see them right now, aren't very developed. But on the other hand, for varieties such as maybe Frontenac or Marquette or Leon Milo or Lucy Kuhlman, uh, we very well could have had less hardy buds. And so we're going to be watching this in the next few weeks as buds break. And I think that you're going to see those buds break in, in a few weeks to see if we have any gaps in some of these really hardy varieties that we know made it through the Jan January 22nd event, but if we see any damage to those buds as time goes on. So just to give you a chart of basically the temperature trends that we saw, how the winter went, um, January, February, March, and April are mean temperatures. Uh, January was about a degree and a half colder than the 10-year average. February, half a degree warmer. March, considerably warmer, two degrees warmer. And April, uh, a little bit less at 1.2 degrees. Now, if I were to go check for May, uh, up from the 1st of May to the, to the middle, I, I know that it would be quite a bit below average. And so for temperature leads us directly into thinking about heat, because it's not just incidents of daily temperature that make buds develop or make tissue, plant tissue develop. It's the heat. It's how long we, we get those temperatures for. So when we look at uh, the growing degree days, I use a base of five degrees this time of year because that's a better proxy for early season development, especially in some of the hybrids. So we've been all over the place this year. Um, uh, 2022, the current year's data is the red line, and the dotted uh, black line is the, again, the 10-year average. So we started out a little bit above the average, and then we spent time very close to the average, and then in the month of May, we definitely went well below the average. Now, I, I again, I've updated this plot right up to this afternoon's temperature. So as you can see here, we're dramatically, uh, with the warmer temperatures that we had today and yesterday, we are now going to probably cross that that 10 year average line I, I look at things on on the lower side of the 10 year average line as being the cooler years uh remember uh, 2019 and 2020 uh both of those were, were definitely cool years I, I think 2020 was a year it snowed five times in may we actually had accumulations of snow on the ground 2019 the year just wouldn't warm up and things above that line uh the above average years years that are you know turned out to be quite good for us in the industry. So 2017, uh, 2018, or 2018 minus the freeze, and the freeze wasn't good. And again, 2021. So it seems that this year, we have been hanging out with the below average years, but we're about to transition over into the above average years. And certainly I, I'm, gonna, I'm hoping that this is gonna hold, because that's been a good driver, a good proxy um, for how mature our crop gets before we harvest it. So, We've been collecting data or we've been receiving data for 12 years from Domaine Grand Pre on bud break in various varieties. And one of those is Lucy Kuhlman. Uh, Lucy Kuhlman, uh, if you're not familiar, would be uh, not unlike Leon Below, not unlike Marquette. It's a, it's a hardy um, hybrid red, um, probably over winters in the minus 30 range. But like Marquette, like these other uh, red hybrids, it breaks bud very early. I don't know of any variety in the valley here that breaks, that the buds break any earlier than that. So we have about 12 years of data and that gave us the opportunity to, to do a little math, a little mathematical modeling to see, you know, what, what are the conditions that we need for those buds to break? And, and we came up with a, a, a calculation, a prediction that 155 base five degree days from March 1st. So you can see 
in this graph, this is the same as the previous one. I've, I've zeroed all the three days at March 1st, and I've just accumulated them on through uh, uh, the rest of this plot. And so for instance, we can see that the point here in where in 2017, the orange line, where it crosses, where it intersects with 155 degree day threshold, that's where we would anticipate bud break would be. And the orange dot that's there is not just the predicted uh, bud break date, it's the actual bud break date. So we can see the orange dot very close to where the orange line intersects the threshold. Same in uh, uh, 2021 and the same in 2018. So this model, these 12 years of data have given us a reasonably tight model uh, on average plus or minus three days discrepancy um, between the actual bud break day and the predicted day uh, with based on, on degree days. So with that, the question remains, when we think buds will break this year. I mean, that's, that's really the big question. So the red line again is the 2022 data. You can see we've been running um, a little bit above average for a while and then definitely running below average in the month of May. But again, this very sudden upturn. So we are this gap between where we are as of this afternoon, right here is where the, where the red line terminates and the 155 degree threshold, there's about 45 base five degree days in the middle. And if I look at the forecast temperatures, it would, it would seem to me that we're going to be going to uh, reach that accumulation, those additional 45 heat units over the next three to four days. So that would put bud break for Lucy Kuhlman uh, Monday, Monday or Tuesday. Um, and, and I think looking at uh, some other varieties that we have in our research vineyard that are good proxies for bud break uh, in, in Lucy Kuhlman, I, I, I think we'll probably see that. On average, we would expect them to break, uh, you know, the average, average heat unit accumulation uh, lines up with about May 18th. So on average, we would expect it to happen on May 18th, but the specifics, of course, are given by the, the accumulation of heat units for any given year. So again, I, I, I predict looking at this, we'll probably see the, the very earliest bud break, the very earliest varieties uh, on the first of next week. So moving on past beyond temperature, let's talk about uh, precipitation. Uh, with the harder winter, with the colder temperatures, came a good snowpack. So we had uh, significant accumulations of snow through uh, January and February. And that actually, when we look at that, convert that to a rainfall equivalent, that's left us with a good degree of moisture going into this year. Um, although uh, we lost our snow you know, by the, the end of the first week of March, um, there's been good moisture in the ground, but because we lost our snow so early, uh, that, that's not that moisture, that contribution of moisture that we got, would have got by the middle of March is no longer having much of an impact on the, on the soil moisture. And I could tell today, back at the research station, every tractor, every piece of equipment that was turning over land was enshrouded in a cloud of dust. Uh, so conditions are starting to dry up, uh, especially um, we've had 87 millimeters. We had 87 millimeters of rain in April, uh, which is about average, but we got most of that in early April. And in the last few weeks, uh, you know, end of April and May, we've got much less. So again, showing that here, uh, the, the blue line is the 10-year uh, average. Uh, the red bar is uh, this year's accumulation of rain for April uh, at 87 millimeters. So very close to the average, but um, if we look back here, 2019, anybody remembers 2019, the year it wouldn't warm up and it wouldn't dry out. People were getting the tractor stuck in their, in their vineyards and orchards uh, because they were just so soft. Uh, anyway, this year is nothing like that. So if I look at uh, April precipitation across the province, uh, I was a little surprised and, and I've been keeping track of this very large forest fire burning in Yarmouth, thinking that maybe they were drier than us, but, but that's not actually the case. Um, we seem to actually be in a lower rainfall band in the middle of the province and in both the southern and northern extent they, they're having more rain. In spite of that, uh, Yarmouth is still having uh, conditions dry enough to uh, allow this wildfire to spread to quite a large area, which is unfortunate for them. However, as I look at our own data, our own uh, uh, rainfall for the month of April, we're probably not in much better shape. Um, we're definitely not in any better shape than Yarmouth is. So hopefully we don't see those types of events uh, here, but it's, I guess it's always a possibility. So from rainfall, uh, 
talk about um, soil temperatures. This one may be a little counterintuitive if you uh, if you haven't been tracking the way way these things kind of progress. So we started off because we lost our snow so early by the middle of March here. And again, the, the red line is the soil temperature for 2022. And the black line is the 10 year trend. So we were well above the 10 year trend through the back half of March and essentially all of April, simply because we had no snow. Solar radiation is what drives uh, soil temperatures early in the season. The air temperature has is, is a component, but it's, it's, it's a smaller uh, factor than, uh, than solar radiation alone. And as long as it's not excessive rain, excessive cloudy days, this continues on. But we can see here early in May that we started to lose ground. We actually fell below average a bit. Although we have regained that in the sunnier, drier days uh, that have come uh, in the last week or so. So overall, I mean, uh, soil temperatures are good. We, you know, the, uh, I think I updated this on Monday. I would expect uh, probably sometime this week, uh, they broke the 10 degree mark. That's a very good um, soil temperature to have this time of year in grape because it's got lots of root genesis, lots of activity in the level of roots. So the plants as buds break can begin to absorb nutrients and move those nutrients up to the tissues where they're needed. So I look at phenology. So on Tuesday, I went out to take some, some nice pictures of buds so I could put in my presentation, thinking that was gonna be a good, uh, that, that condition would hold. So on the left, we have a, uh, a Lacadie Blanc bud here. And on the right, we have a Marquette bud. And I would, I would put those at uh, late bud swell, early woolly bud stage. Um, looking at those, they, you know, they, they're definitely progressing, but they don't look like they're gonna break anytime soon. So that was Tuesday. I went out at three o'clock this afternoon, pictures of the same varieties in the same spots of the vineyard. And as you can see, and actually I'll go back and point something out. You can see over here on this Lackady bud right here, you can see a very small secondary bud uh, uh, starting to pop up, starting to develop. It's not as clear on the market, but right here you see the same thing. That's a bit of a secondary bud starting to uh, develop. Now today, those buds, two days later, have, uh, have definitely developed. They're starting to push as well. You know, we can no longer call any of these uh, buds well. We are definitely into the woolly bud stage and well into the woolly bud stage. So I think these, this what I'm, what I'm seeing in the actual phenology of the buds um, coincides with, what, with our prediction and, and where, where I think bud break is going to be for our earliest varieties. Uh, the forecast, long-term forecast for Climate Change Canada, usually, I think ever since I've been showing these, we're always in a high probability of above average temperatures. And although there still is a moderate probability of above average temperatures for the months of May, June, and July, um, their um, chance of that happening are a little bit lower than what they have been in past few springs. So it's inter interesting that the summer doesn't look across Canada like it's going to be that warm, at least that's what the modeling would suggest. Um, we'll see how that plays out. They update this uh, this forecast every month. So by the time I talk to you next time, we'll have another full set of, of forecasts. And that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Of course, if you have any questions, you can contact either myself or Harrison. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for your presentation. If somebody has a, any question, please, I invite you to write your question on the bottom of your screen in the Q&A feature. So Jeff, it's interesting to see how has been uh, moving on the, the, the temperatures and how is the and how was the winter? Because from there we can get a, a lot of information plus what Harrison showed. So uh, for, for what I saw, it's a uh, very interesting the, the, the forecast. So more or less, when are you expecting to see the, the vineyards in the research station to have bad burst and which variety are you expecting first? So in our research vineyard, we have uh, Lacadie, Blanc, Chardonnay, Riesling, Vidal, Marquette, Lyon Malo, New York Muscat. So as I've walked through and scattered the, the, the block this week, I expect our Marquette will break uh, sometime early next week, uh, definitely by the middle of the week. And, and again, there will be maybe a 10 to 15% of the buds will have broken by then. Our Lackadie, 
when I looked at it today at three o'clock, it wasn't very far behind the Marquette. So I suspect we're going to see Lackady very close. Our Chardonnay, and of course our Chardonnay as a fair bit of winter injury, seem to be a long ways away. Some years Chardonnay and Lackady are quite close, and some years th there's a difference. And uh, I expect Steve can speak to that here in a little bit to talk about his Chardonnay and where he thinks those buds are, if they're close to the bud or not. So I, I think that we'll start to see uh, two varieties, uh, Lackady Blanc and Marquette break uh, early next week. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I think that that will be happening, especially as you already said, the temperature will increase a lot these next couple of days. We, we probably will see 45 base five heat units in the next three days. Uh, and think about that, that's the, you know, we haven't gotten that over the last two weeks. Yeah, yeah, it, it will be definitely a, a, a nice shift and looking forward to see the, the vines uh, popping up. Yeah. So if nobody else has a question, I would like to thank again, Jeff, for, for his presentation and all the information and how it, it was a very nice to compliment between Harrison and him. So now we will pass to one of the sections that we have a, a waiting for many people because it's where we have the discussions and usually between growers, Steve and Marcel Cobb, as I said at the beginning, sadly, is, uh, Marcel was unable to attend today, but we'll have a very nice uh, discussion and listening also uh, Jeff and, and Harrison. So Steve, just to start with you, because these other two gentlemen have been talking a lot. Uh, how was your observation about your side, uh, about the winter and the pruning and the wood conditions? Uh, yeah, so our, our, we were one of the lucky sites that uh, Harrison and, and Jeff kind of both described. Um, we're tucked here in, under the North Mountain, pretty good elevation on most of it. Uh, our low was minus 21. Um, we do, uh, the, the only thing that we really saw much damage on is we have one block of Chardonnay that's kind of down at the bottom of the hill and a little bit of a low spot. And um, we don't have a temperature sensor in that specific spot, but but we are noticing that the, the, we did get some bud loss in that one section of Chardonnay. Everything else came through pretty good. Um, Pruning went, went good. We, the wood looks really healthy pretty much everywhere. Uh, one thing we did notice that we were a little surprised about, and because we didn't really see it on the leaves uh, at the end of the season last fall, but we did see some uh, powdery residue on, on one block of Lacadie, uh, which kind of caught us by surprise while we were pruning. Because like I say, we, we didn't see it on the leaves, but it, it's definitely on the wood. So um, we'll address that while we've already addressed it. So. Um, other than that, I think the overall the wood wood was looked really good this year. Uh, pruning went good. We've been done pruning for about two weeks. We start pretty early with the hybrids and then uh, transition through to the to the vinifera. Thank you, thank you, Steve. It's interesting to to see in the wood things that you were unable to watch through the growing season. So it, it provides you a, a good information to take the the proper management strategies. So Harrison, I would like to ask you like a similar question. I don't know if you have been how much involved in the pruning of the vines at the research station, but if you have any observation of what you have seen, I can see laugh between Jeff and Harrison. So I, I had good intentions of being out in the vineyard this year. Um, various things with work and COVID got in the way. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Jeff field uh, any pruning observations or anything he's seen pruning this year. It was it was definitely more Jeff. Perfect. He, he was you, always Harris. he was always there in spirit. I can say that oh, yeah, he was yeah. always there in spirit. <laughs> I was texting Jeff. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so one thing that we did notice, and now that Harris and I talked about it, we did see dieback in in some varieties. We saw some dieback in Lackadie, and we saw some dieback in Marquette. It's not the first time we've seen that dieback in Lackadie. And, and when I talk about dieback, I mean where we see from that from the tip of the of the remaining shoot, the overwintering shoot down some distance into the into the, the, the depth of the shoot, we see that the, the wood just dies. I've seen it in other sites. Um, we, we, one of the things that Harris and I would be texting back and forth on would be our theories on why this is happening, because we don't have a tight theory on exactly why this happens, some years and not others. 
Uh, definitely, we think crop loan could be an issue, but sometimes you can we go, go to places where there's been heavy crop load and, and it's not obvious that they're having any more dieback than anybody else. There does seem to be some condition and it may very well be an early winter condition that, that drives this um, when we get cold temperatures early on. So just on that point, Jeff, to muddy the, muddy the waters even more, you remember uh, we actually have a crop load trial ongoing at the research station as well. We had it this past year. Um, so we had we had essentially four different crop loads and it, it had to do with how many cordons we put down and had to do with if we thin the crop or not. So we went to the extreme. So in Lacadie, we had uh, we had four treatments and the lowest one had two tons per acre and the highest one had eight tons per acre. Eight, and again, we're trying to push limits here. Eight tons per acre, you shouldn't do that to your Lacadie. Um, although interestingly, we actually measured the dieback or Kat did. Um, and we saw no correlation between like the ones that the dieback was just as heavy in the two tons per acre ones as it was in the eight tons per acre ones. Now we also did a crop load trial in the Marquette and we didn't have near the differences in the Marquette. And I think we went from one ton an acre up to four tons an acre. So we didn't, we, we didn't have the same high crop in our Marquette. And interestingly, we did see a correlation um, in the crop load. The ones with the heavy crop load, the four tons an acre, which isn't really heavy, but that's, that's, that's moderate to heavy for a Marquette. Uh, you know, we did see higher dieback in those ones, but not so. I, I, Jeff and I took separate ends of this argument, and I guess we were both wrong or both right, depending on which cultivar <laughs> we were talking about. But, um, but again, uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I will complicate a little bit even more because, for what I have seen through the season, depending on the area and the, the conditions, I saw. I don't know if to say dieback, but definitely trunk diseases in Chardonnay, Riesling, or New York Muscat, and even in, in some areas with Kaisenheim. So it's important to keep an eye on, on the wood conditions, not only for the bad hardiness, also for which other factors uh, that can be affecting the, the vines. So just to, to be open mind that we have to tackle the, the, the issues depending on what we have and not be supposition. So, it's interesting. And again, I'm agreeing with you about the, the crop load. It's good to, to, to keep an eye on how it can affect uh, before going to, to the winter. And harvest date too, like I always find, I can find a little bit of correlation sometimes between some dieback or, or wheat canes, maybe is, is a way to describe it on, on harvest date and how much, how many days or weeks I have of green leaves uh, still with photosynthetic activity after your harvest date. And uh, I think that, you know, that has a big factor in how healthy those vines are going into winter and how hardy they, how, how quick they can get hardy. So, um, but that's something we've always observed. Uh, and, and I know just talking about wood health and everything, we, uh, we left one little block, about eight rows of um, Chardonnay for late harvest, so the 809 clone, and that's the worst looking wood in the vineyard. <laughs> so mm. it's uh it, not that it's horrible but it's just it's noticeably the kind of the you know it's you don't like to see that tinge of gray in the wood so much and, and that's the worst looking wood in the vineyard for the late harvest yeah important to keep in, in consideration that that and also part of the nutrient management which will be, be touching at the end of, of this question q a section so, okay, we passed through winter. We know how is the stage. We have some trunk diseases, sadly. And, and also you already mentioned, Steve, that you saw in Lacadie some powder immunity. So I want to take you to the spray strategies. Of course. But Marcel's not here. No, sadly enough, he's not here. So Steve, uh, which considerations are you keeping for your sprayer and which products are you thinking to apply or, or if you have applied before bad burst? Well, I mean, the first thing with sprayer is about a month and a half, two months ago, you probably should have rebuilt your pump if you needed to and go over with a fine tooth comb because it's probably the most important tool in your vineyard for the next four months. Um, and then we always do a full calibration. Like we do a full, a full uh, maintenance package on the sprayer, and then we do a full calibration. Um, check all the nozzles. Replace the nozzles is always a good idea. If you re replace them for some reason late in uh, the season last year, I mean, you could give them a test. We uh, we use a bottle, uh, thirty seconds 
of uh, from each nozzle into a bottle and mark it to see if they're all given the same output, calculate it. So I uh, can't stress enough doing a good full calibration and check your nozzles. Um, as far as uh, what we're looking at for our first sprays, we've been out and, and got most of the vineyard with the lime sulfur spray already. Uh, we did detect, uh, like I mentioned, some some residue, some spores left over from last year, a little bit of a little bit of downy, not too much downy, but we saw some powdery around. So um, we definitely wanted to get that out. And we also saw elevated levels of arinium mite last year. Um, so we wanted to really make sure that we got a lime sulfur out there. I mean, uh, an oil spray, a dormant oil spray is great too. It's just a personal preference. I don't know if one's really better than the other. So, uh, but I would really look at that health of the vines. If there's spores on there, you're seeing those black spots on them and everything. Um, or if, if you think back, look at your notes from last year and, and you saw uh, elevated areniumite, you, you want to get out there and get a dormant spray on for sure. So oh, sorry, I was mute. So thank you very much for, 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 for the explanation. Yes, it's quite important to, to keep in mind this, the calibration is essential just to, to be aware of how you are putting out the product and also what is happening in your vineyard. Do I have or not a disease to, to apply? So, sorry, Harrison, I will jump directly to Jeff right now. So, Jeff, uh, which uh, spray strategy are you using in the research station? Uh, are you applying like similar approach to Steve with the products before buffers or how you do it? So, we, we did, uh, because I think it's easier in a conventional program, we seem to have good control of both downy and powdery last year. So um, I, I mulled over doing a lime sulfur, but in, in the end decided not to do it. Um, but so in terms of spray strategy, we will start uh, not until our vinifera break bud that we'll start with the sulfur program for a first couple of weeks. And then we'll rotate it with things like Solvran and Luna Tranquility, a full pan those products in different mixes to try to mix up our classes as much as possible to get us through, through the season. But of course, the conventional program has that, uh, has that benefit. That's something that we can do. Uh, but right now, we, I usually don't put on my, or don't call for my first spread. I'm not even the one who puts it on until after we see bud break in the vinifera. Uh, I, I, I take a bit, of a, a bit of a holiday with the hybrids. And so far, we haven't been penalized for doing that. Yeah, I, I'm very happy to hear that, that you have that approach. If you don't have anything, you don't have to apply. Okay. So you are saving resources. You are not contaminating the environment. And come on, the expenses are quite high right now, we have to be honest, so it's good. So Harrison, because I want to be democ enough democratic. So are you agree with, with this approach uh, as well, like to, to apply or apply depending on what it's outside? Yeah, especially I agree. I mean, again, uh, yeah, good to talk to Jeff first. He he's more hands on the vineyard, um, but yeah, I agree. Especially with the hybrids, quite often they they show a little bit more, uh, or less sensitivity to some some of those diseases, and you can get away with that. Uh, our hybrids, Lacadia and Marquette, and we had very few problems. I think I think we're, when we do have issues, it's more. I think Riesling is is our biggest problem in our vineyard more with botrytis than anything else um i know jeff when you were printing did you see any signs of downy or powdery from last year or, or not i i didn't i didn't see any signs uh, I, sh I shouldn't say i didn't see any signs i didn't see enough that i was concerned uh yeah. we when we we get some harder products in the season uh again it, no no different than what i saw the previous year in fact maybe a little bit less than what i saw the previous year uh and not enough that it worried me that i couldn't get control of it uh, later on Although I agree with Steve, you know, that's a, that putting that lime sulfur on early saves so many problems later. And you're always weighing it. Is it worthwhile to do it or not? Um, yeah, I, I think if definitely if we were cropping with a even a lighter conventional or in an organic system, it would probably always be almost a standard to go ahead yeah. and do that uh, as, as just to prevent problems or uh, to lessen the load down the road. Yeah, different approaches. I think in case you don't have anything, it, it, it's possible unless, again, you're right, if you're organic and you have to take out, take care of the, the crop, value crop, it, it wouldn't harm. 
and, and hats off to anybody who ran an organic program last year and got through the season and was able to keep the leaves on their plants. It was a horrible year to mm. do that, a horrible year to do that. Yeah, uh, a tough, a tough one, that's for sure. So thinking about, okay, let's think that everything is going out through the next week, the, the bad burst. Steve, when are you expecting after bad burst to have the, the first spray application? So there's a lot of depends there, of course. Um, weather's huge, right? So I'm going to really watch the weather, uh, look for that 10 degree mark and, and precipitation and everything, that whole combination. I mean, one of the rules we go by for um, spore pressure is uh, the 10, 10, 10, 10 degrees, so 10 millimeters of rain for 10 hours, uh, which will encourage a good load of spores in the vineyard. So we watch that really close. Um, I really like to try to get through until you're kind of in that six to eight leaf stage because you're actually got a good target to spray on then. If, if you're spraying before then, you're getting a lot of material out for, um, for not very much protection, right? It, it's so, and usually that correlates, in, in our vineyard, we find that correlates pretty well, that really we're getting the right temperatures and, and the right amount of moisture about when we hit that kind of six to eight leaf stage. So um, at that point, we'd go in, we'd put uh, kind of a micronutrient package on, we'd make sure we're putting some iron on and some uh, boron uh, for sure, maybe depending on bunch of values and everything we might put a a, a light uh fertigation on like a light a light uh, foliar fertility spray on and uh probably sulfur we probably the first two or three sprays kind of like what jeff was saying there we'd probably go with sulfur and, and that would be for protection um against the, the mildew spores but but also as a little bit more of a backup against the irinium mite as well okay before going back to the, the to the nutrients or whatever so you are doing these first applications um, and you said already you have the consideration of precipitation, growth, everything, but something I'm always curious and I receive quite often the question is at which speed you would recommend to be driving? <laughs> I'm talking about the speed at which is wind speed you will stop a spraying. Yeah, so I, I think I think pretty much the industry standard on, on spraying, they say the actual ideal spraying conditions are somewhere between, you know, five to 15 kilometers an hour winds. Um, more than that, it's getting a little edgy. I think they have a hard cutoff at 20 now is what uh, Canada is kind of recommending. Uh, anything below five, you're not really getting enough air movement for it to settle onto the plant. Uh, of course, we're using air blast sprayers, so maybe that's not really applicable for what we're doing, but... Uh, those are kind of industry standards. Um, as far as spray speed goes, it uh, depends on what kind of sprayer you're using. Uh, we've got a pretty good high capacity sprayer. Um, for these dormant sprays, these early on sprays where you don't have a big target to go against, I, I like to be down around four kilometers an hour. Um, I, I mean, we and we've got a pretty good sprayer. We've got a tower sprayer with a good fan on it. And we use the uh, we use the orange nozzles, the, the European style orange, orange nozzles. So it's a fairly big droplet. Um, but I find if you if you push that, now we've got a self-regulating sprayer, right? A, a flow control. Uh, if you push it up into four and a half, five kilometers an hour, you're actually upping your pressure enough. You're getting a pretty fine droplet and it's just blowing all over the vineyard because there's not very much there for it to hit, right? So um, we do like to stay, stay slowed down a little bit. Uh, around around we find around fours right but if if i was using a converted small orchard sprayer i'd probably want to be down at three and a half um if i was using an over the row two row sprayer maybe i push it and uh, where you're spraying both ways and in, into there i might push it up to five but i wouldn't go over five five would be my limit for sure okay and it's good what you mentioned about the nozzle so do you have all the nozzles open all the time or you are choosing a little bit depending on where is there? Okay. Oh, right. Right now I'm just using the bottom three. So, um, you know, uh, depending on your nozzles, of course, uh, muscat, you know, I might use the, the top four and shut off the bottom, bottom ones right now. So it depends where your buds are, what you're trying to hit. Um, we don't worry too much about the woody trunks, you know, for, for the dormant spray and we want where the buds are and everything to, to clean that up. So, um, 
but yeah, for the everything on VSP, we're just using the bottom three nozzles uh, for high wire cordons like a muscat or I know some people do petite pearl that way. Uh, we're just using the top three or four, kind of depends how they're tied down. Perfect. Thank you to mention that. Yes, depending on how is your trellis system and which is the variety. Come on, in the first sprays, you can close uh, a couple of them and continue with the rest. Yeah, I mean, and this year, uh, you know, <laughs> I think we got to be thinking cost of production all the time. And uh, this year, more than anything, I mean, we're, we kind of look through the numbers. We're guessing at this point, but about a 15 to 18%. Uh, increase in our cost of production over last year and I mean last year was up too right so um, with labor and fuel and, and chemical prices and everything it's I think you really got to be thinking every time and don't don't go out there and just spray for the heck of it yeah that, that, that's important yes be efficient so Steve I will skip you I will go with the, these two other gentlemen and I want to ask about a little bit about nutrient management. So my question will be for you guys, are you taking some uh, or applying any kind of fertilizer? Uh, do you take any soil sample? How do you strategize this? Or which is your, your strategy for the, for the season? If you want me to talk a little bit first and you maybe talk about it. So, um... I get, yeah, we, we do take nutrient samples. We take uh, nutrient samples, uh, tissue nutrient samples every year. We send our pedials. Um, you, you take it around for azon. Uh, that's a pretty good indicator for nitrogen. And we look at all the nutrients. Um, you get subsidized right through the NSDA if you're a, if a registered farmer. So that's it's nice. It's pretty, it's pretty affordable. Um, and it's, you don't want to be wasting nutrients. Um, so, uh, yeah, and also we don't measure the soil every year. We are measuring it this year. I think on average, we try and do it every second or third year. Um, but uh, usually don't measure the nitrogen in the soil, but you measure a lot of other things and there's guidelines. Um, I guess on that note, I'm not, I don't want to plug anything, but we are interested in nutrients. And there is some mystery about the nutrients. I mean, what, what nutrients do vinifera need? What nutrients do hybrids need? Uh, how much is leaving the vineyard? You know, how much do you need? Um, what, what's the base amount of nutrients you need and everything. I, I think uh, the NSDA suggests 40 kilograms. I can't remember if it's an acre or a hectare as, as a base every year, but um, again, you can apply this in different ways. But again, it's the type of thing, especially with the cost of fertilizer this year, which is up precipitously. Um, it's never a good idea to waste fertilizer, even if it was cheap. But uh, you know, this year, you really want to understand what your plants really need before you start putting the nutrients to them. Yeah, that's something you don't want to be wasting. Um, Jeff, you can add anything to that? Or? Well, no, that's, uh, yeah, you've said the bulk right there. Um, because we're doing research in the vineyard, we do a lot of tissue samples as part of the research. So we're always getting feedback. Uh, but uh, in addition, addition to that, while I'm pruning, you know, I'm looking at, at the distance between buds. I'm looking at the canes and give me an idea of how vigorous the plant was the year before. Um, one thing that we have noticed in our, our grafted and a lot of our vinifera on rootstock for 309, um, it, it is as if, and I can't say this is for sure is happening, but I'm, I'm curious about this, that it's doing a better job of, uh, of picking up resources and, and uh, bringing nitrogen in and, and pr promoting a vigorous canopy than our, uh, our non-grafted, our Lacti and our Marquette and our, our Leon Melo. So, so we're to the point now where we're looking at those varieties and having to fertilize them differently, even though you know the whole thing is within a one hectare block. Um, we're, we have to we have to have to address them by the specifics of the crop. We planted our vineyard in 2016. You know things are are stabilizing quite well, uh, but we are starting to see some patterns. So, um, we fundamentally have a low phosphorus problem that we've been trying to correct over the years. Uh, we've been able to do that with granular fertilizer for the most part, at least get it to within the ranges that we want. And so now this year, our game will, will switch more to uh, getting the right amount of, of nitrogen and potassium as part of that. Uh, whereas phosphorus has been driving my fertilizer program for the last, well, for every year, except for this one. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of feedback. I, and different people ask me, I'm sure they ask everybody here what, what a good uh, nutrition management plan is. And I, I think it's just, it's gotta be based on feedback. Uh, so something that you're looking at, uh, the distance between your buds, your internodal growth, your tissue analysis, all those things uh, to me are part of it. And there's many different ones. I'm sure there's many ways to be successful at this, many different ways to add your inputs. 
but at the end of the day, something that that gives you feedback and action and that you monitor it over years to keep track of things is is what I would recommend, certainly. I think that's good advice too, as far as uh, like actually the guidelines, like the guy, I find the guidelines are a bit iffy, like uh, it really depends on the cultivar, it depends on the site, um, it depends on the performance. I guess the main thing is to keep your own records to measure every year, you know, compared to previous years. If you see something trending up or trending down, I mean, you become the expert in your own vineyard in terms of, you know, what's coming out of it. You do your own testing, you do it at the same time every year, you do it the same way every year. Um, and if you keep, you know, you, you take very representative examples as well. Um, and so it, it's really something that the onus is on the individual growers too. I mean, again, there's lots of, there's lots of information out there about uh, how to go about this, but I guess, uh, I guess you you know the performance of your own vineyard the best. And the, the main thing is to take consistent measurements and, and keep records and, and keep track of what's going up, what's going down, how is this affecting potentially your performance and, and things of that nature. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely agree, Harrison. I think the most important is what you do in your own property. Maybe you can use some information in the literature just to guide you a little bit, but it's depending on each side. So, Steve, which is your strategy, for example? So we, we do a lot of testing. Um, we're, we're, we like data, for sure. So we do tissue samplings, we do sap samplings. Um, we also do soil sampling. So like we do two or three sap samples and two or three, uh, tissue samples a year through, through the vineyard, a bunch of different varieties and growing sites within the vineyard. Um, then we do soil samples. We do some samples every year, but we kind of bounce back and forth. So we're kind of doing them every year, every other year, but different, different sites within the vineyard sort of thing. So basically the the same blocks get tested every other year and we, and we use that data too. So um, then we kind of plug that in to what we're looking for. Uh, another thing that we look at sometimes, we didn't get all the numbers last year, but we look at Yan uh, just to see how much nitrogen was, was there in the grapes when, when they were going to ferment, uh, which is a really great indication of, of uh, what you ended up with, what was in the grape actually. Um, so we kind of plug that into a model we, we have, and then we come up with what we're going to do every year on an individual basis. So we, we really don't have a standard approach. It's, it depends a lot on the previous growing season. Um, as far as adding fertility, we do a lot of green manure. So we grow, we till in the sod from every other row. Uh, we do a, a grass and clover mix to create a lot of fixed nitrogen. Um, so I'll finish probably going through with the spader and, and tilling all that in, in the next two or three days. Uh, so that'll be there for, and we, I would really like to get that tilled in and Jeff kind of mentioned it too. I, I like to get that tilled in as the soil hits 10 degrees C, um, fluffing that up with the spader will help it get to the 10 degrees C quicker. And then that's when it really starts to break down and, and we can get that nitrogen fixation, uh, and release, which takes three or four weeks. And so that's why we do those first couple of sprays. We might put a little bit of fertility, foliar fertility in to get it through, but then three weeks from now that green manure's uh, hitting the roots pretty nicely. So, um, and then with whatever we decided we need above that green manure, then we would probably put that on um, as a broadcast fertilizer custom mix somewhere kind of around bud break or shortly after bud break. And, and Harrison said it too, we, we manage the hybrids different than the vinifera. We find there's, well, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to ruin any of your uh, data, Harrison, but we, we find there's upwards of 20 to 30 units nitrogen difference between the two, between uh, hybrids and, and vinifera. Yeah, I would really like to, to, to mention, you know, Harrison will talk. Now it's, it's necessary to keep in mind that each variety will behave differently. And if you have or not a rootstock, it will behave differently. It exists already a lot of literature outside showing and proving that both in hybrids and vinifera varieties. And also at Perennia, we did a, a very complete study about nutrients, which is available in the great blog and online, how the nutrients interact with different factors. So I will invite you to take a look in, in the great blog as well. Harrison, please. 
Steve, I was just going to get you to elaborate. You were on the nitrogen, and the, I assume you mean 23, 30 more units you know, are required by the by the hybrids in general. Is, is that what you think? And would you is your sense because they have 20, 30 percent higher crop? Like you're mostly talking about Lacadia, I guess, or um, is your is your, you think that's accounted for the crop, or just the nature of not having a rootstock, and they're a little bit harder to they're, they're not quite as good at taking up the nutrients as some of the as some of the um, what I, what I should say, cultivar, rootstock cultivars that are bred for that, uh, that the vinifer get to use, or what, would you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's it's some combination of all those factors. I, I don't really know. I, I just know from uh, general observance in the vineyard, like that we find that the, if, if we manage them the same, the hybrid struggle. Yeah. Vinifera look absolutely fantastic. Like we can grow, we can grow a crop of vinifera like Chardonnay with, without, adding almost anything, you know, adding virtually nothing besides the green manure, the natural mm -hmm. fertility. Uh, we can grow a successful crop of Chardonnay, but um, to do it, and it's Frontenac, I think Frontenac is probably the worst, actually, even worse than, than Lacadie, but um, it, uh, you need to add that extra fertility to really get the, the It can complement a little bit that. I have done a, more than a couple of observations. You're right, it's a combination of factors at the end of the day. Different varieties will uptake differently the nutrient and the production will be different as well. For example, it's normal to see like a vinifera variety producing 8.1.8 to 2 kgs of grapes per plant when the, the hybrids, they can produce double. So that also produces something. Mm -hmm. And plus the uptake of nutrients will be differently depending on the, the rootstock or not. And something to keep in mind because we have to, to say it very out loud, it's nitrogen is one nutrient, but we have other nutrients. For example, as Steve already mentioned, Frontenac. Let's keep in mind that Frontenac or the Minnesota varieties, they have some issues with magnesium. So this has to be applied in different ways. We are applying a lot of dolomitic line, which contains magnesium, but also is good to complement it at different stages just to, to mitigate and balance. So that's an interesting too. When uh, that you just mentioned right there, Francisco, because a lot of people, I think, they, they consider they should use calcinic lime to add calcium to the soil, right? Because, I mean, grapes are hungry for calcium at certain stages. But uh, what we find is, is to get that magnesium in there, because we do grow quite a bit of Frontenac and, and Lacadie, it's, we use the dolomitic lime, but then uh, in the spring, as part of our custom fertilizer mix, we put gypsum in to uh, boost the calcium level. Yeah, and the gypsum has a very good benefit that it's it's very soluble. You doesn't you don't require a lot of water to integrate to the soil profile. It will help also to the soil soil structure. It will provide some sulfur, which are missing in the majority of our soils. And it's something to keep in mind with the gypsum, we are not changing the pH, but we are providing calcium to the plants, which is the necessary. So I don't know if somebody else wants to say something before we are closing this uh, section. Jeff, Harrison. I guess, I guess I just one more follow-up comment about uh, maybe a plug for research. There is there is a lot that we're interested in in terms of nutrients. And, and Steve, you mentioned about um, the difference between cultivars, uh, the needs, and uh, we we're also seeing this. Uh, also, it's interesting the interplay between like you know, there's the, there's the plant, the roots, there's the cane material, there's the fruit, there's the leaves. We we usually only measure the leaves, um, nutrients, but the interplay in nutrients between these things is very complex and dynamic. It also seems to be quite different between cultivars, especially hybrids versus vinifera, but also particular particular varieties seem to have their strengths or their weaknesses um the, the crop load can really affect those nutrient levels you measure in the pedials and we saw that like for instance in 2018 we measure our nutrients every year we lost a bunch of things especially marquette was hard hit because it was so early 2018 and we saw because it, because the fruit themselves are such a such a sink for potassium we saw our uh, potassium levels in our pedials skyrocket that there they went up like 100 percent in one year because they didn't have a crop they used, they were used to having like three or four tons an acre that's what we were, we were anticipating i guess in 2018 it's probably three tons probably an acre that year but anyway um we saw that potassium go through the roof and the magnesium went down too when you you have to also remember some of these nutrients you know some of them are synergistic and some of them are antagonistic 
And so especially potassium, if you start getting, if you have a low crop and you start having really high potassium levels, um, you start seeing really low magnesium levels. You start seeing really low calcium levels. These are competing cations. So um, this, this can affect uh, the fruit quality, it can affect other things in the plant. And, and some cultivars can create deficiencies of certain ones because you have an excess of one nutrient. But um, again, not, not, to, uh, not to discourage anyone, but some of these things, uh, you know, can, can be quite complex, the dynamics between some of these nutrients and you the, and the right, year Harrison. variability. You're right, Harrison, I can complement. I have done good amount of analysis. Usually our soils, they are having poor amount of potassium. 18 was a very tricky year, especially the next year, the following year. Yeah. But in terms of wood, usually we have very low levels of nitrogen, very low levels of carbohydrates, which are quite essential and important for the following season to, to have the bad birds. Mm -hmm. That's why one of the strategies that we are using usually here is to apply some foliar nitrogen just to help the vines uh, to continue growing. Yes, it, magnesium and calcium, and uh, magnesium, calcium, and potassium, they have a different reaction. So for example, if you put too much potassium, you have a low magnesium. Or if you have too much magnesium, you have low potassium. That, that exists, that, uh, mm. that uh, ratio, the same with calcium or nitrogen potassium. So it's not so simplistic. And that's why we, we like to encourage people to take their own soil um, analysis, take petrium analysis and track and keep a, a, what, what it has been applied. So we have one question uh, I, with that I, I, I will finish. So from name, what form of gypsum is commonly applied? Palletized, powder or solution? How do you apply your, your system? So we use pelletized as part of a custom fertilizer mix. So our, our soils are, have lots of phosphorus in them. So we do a, a mix that has a bit of nitrogen, uh, has a bit of potassium in it. And then we use the pelletized uh, gypsum as the uh, other filler ingredient for that. So it works quite well for us. Perfect. So we answer questions. We have a very nice discussion. Well, presentations about the bad hardiness. Uh, Harrison was kind enough to sum up all the reports and all the articles in one. We continue with Jeff that he'll link that part plus tell us forecast and say how was the season. And we finish with a very nice and interesting discussion about the winter pruning. Again, it was a little redundant, but it was quite good. Uh, the quality of the wood, the spraying strategies, the spray products at the beginning and nutrient management strategies. So the message to take is Take a look to the wood, see how you're pruning, what is happening in the like, uh, previous year can appear in the wood, so which can trigger a different uh, spraying strategy, calibrating the, the, the sprayer and keep in mind conditions to spray and about nutrient management, take your soil analysis, take your petion analysis because as Harrison already mentioned, nobody will know better than you what is happening in your vineyard. So uh, Steve, if you would like to say something else, before finish? Well, the one thing I did notice on, uh, on Harrison's uh, presentation and Jeff's too is, is they have the old banner for uh, grape growers. We need to, we need to get them the new, uh, we need to get them the new graphic there to put on that collaboration slide. So uh, please uh, send that out as soon as you can. Yes. Yeah, I'll get Vanessa right on that. So we'll yeah. get, get the fancy new van banner for you guys to add on to those things. But uh, other than that, I think a great session. It's a good opener. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. I think, uh, Francisco and I were talking, we're hoping to get something out before shoot selection time. So we, uh, I think that's something that we could uh, put a little focus on for next time. Um, and uh, everyone out there, uh, just uh, good growing and cross your fingers for lots of warm temperatures and get those buds open. And, and uh, we'll talk to you all again soon. So thank you very much. Last but not least, Next week, we'll be publishing a, the grape production guide that we created at Florenia with a lot of information about site selection, soil preparation, a canopy management varieties, the most planted until 2018, and a, a, lot, a lot of diseases, a lot of photos. Uh, so please keep tuned because this will be very important and very uh, tight tailored for, for the province. So thank you very much for uh, everyone for attending and thank you very much to our speakers. Can we get signed copies of that guide? For you, obvious. <laughs>
<laughs> See you. Okay. Thanks very much, everyone.